In the government's latest response... You must stay at home. Master of the house, doling out the charm. It's very important that everyone... Know that you are, you are not alone. G'day chemists. So in this video, we're going to go through uh, what is essentially the 2019 HSC paper. So it's in the new style, um, but we're going to go through it with a focus only on the module five questions. And we're also going to have a video for the module six questions and seven and eight and so forth. Um, so this is going to go through those. Um, there are two ways to do this. One is to either pop below and download. There'll be like a, a Google link just down there in the um, in the instructions. Uh, download either the PowerPoint file that I'll make that I'll have just the, it's the questions I'm going to be working through. I might even leave my notes on there if that makes your life easier. Um, so you could download that. You could download the actual paper and just go through these questions. Or probably the simplest way to do it is to wait for each question to come up, press pause, attempt the question, and then go through it that way. Now, when you're doing an HSC question, you're looking probably about a, a minute, minute and a half per mark. Um, some, But when you're doing the HSC, you really want to have a read through it in your reading time and plan out when you're going to do what. Because yeah, we can say like a minute and a half per mark, whatever. Or whatever the, you know, depending on how many marks it is in that sort of three hour block. But the thing that um, does change from time to time is some questions are really quick. For example, there'll be some multiple choice questions which you get to just look at and go, yep, it's that one. But there are other multiple choice questions where you're gonna have to do some pretty long and complex calculations for one mark. So I don't have a plan on the order you want to do questions and yeah, but that's it. But I still think the best way to do this would be to pause the video, uh, watch the, read the question, attempt the question, and then have a look at the answer as it proceeds. I'm going to go through how I work out the answers to all of these. Um, and I've, I've checked these against the, the actual marking criteria as well that they used in the HSC. And some of them will be really surprising. I, I cannot, I cannot stress enough and I'll mention this a few times, make sure, make sure you answer a question. Don't leave blank questions. It's it's just going to, yeah, there, there's some questions which you get marks just for putting something relevant. So make sure you leave, make sure you put an answer down. All right, so let's dive into it. All right, so let's, as I said, have a look at the HSC Module 5 um, questions from the 2019 exam. The very first one, the very first one. So here we have question three. This is our first module five question. Uh, which of the following metal carbonates has the highest molar solubility? And then we have our examples. Um, pause, have a crack at the question, or let's just jump straight into the answer. So first thing we want to look at is the KSP values. Now these come from the data sheet. Okay, so we've got them here. Um, we can see that uh, calcium carbonate. So the actually probably the easiest way to look at this is let's look at the ones that have the um, largest differences. So first off, I can see I've made an error already. Uh, <laughs> this should say 14, <laughs> not 11, uh, not four. So the real quick thing to do is you look at which one has the highest, which one has the lowest. Um, and 3.36 times 10 to the minus nine is actually the largest value, um, which means it's going to be the highest molar solubility. Make sure you know what those phrases mean. Molar solubility means how many moles per liter, which one will do be able to dissolve the most? Um, and that is a calcium carbonate, which has a KSP value, which is not the molar solubility, but we can work it out from the KSP of 3.36 times 10 to the negative nine. Question seven, um, how does the addition of a catalyst affect a reversible reaction? And then again, we've got our possible answers down below. Pause, have a read, and we'll jump in. So, the first thing I would look at is I would look at what does the catalyst do? It reduces the activation energy and the key word there is reversible, which means the reaction goes in both directions. So since we know it goes in both directions, we've got to address how the catalyst affects it in both directions. So that really knocks out 
um, A and B pretty quickly because it's talking about one direction. Um, and then we need to, so C and D, we need to look at the fact that it's reducing the activation energy in both the forward and reverse directions or reactions, which gives us the D there. So here we have two questions. We're going to look at 11 first. Obviously, um, saturated solution of barium uh, carbonate was stored in a flask. Solid barium carbonate containing radioactive carbon-14 was added to the solution. The mixture was allowed to stand for several days and then was filtered. Um, where would we be able to detect basically those radioactive carbon-14 atoms? This is a really fun question. Um, it's, it's some really interesting ideas, and it's to do with the KSP or... Um, solubility sorry reversibility of reactions at so reactions in equilibrium with a precipitate so we've got a saturated solution of barium and we're dealing with the radioactive carbon 14. so um we, to show you how this one works we could use a drawing you can see here we've got barium carbonate atoms and then we've added some radioactive barium carbonate so it's a c14 um, so the radioactive ones are being added, and this is our precip our solid saturated. So once a saturated a solution has become saturated, it starts to build up that solid down the bottom. So what we find is that because the reaction is reversible at that sort of barrier there, this barrier just here, we're going to have start to have some swapping places. So all of a sudden, down here we're going to see both. Uh, radioactive and non-radioactive carbons, which means we're going to find uh, carbon-14, radioactive carbon-14 in both our residue and our filtrate. And that's actually one of the ways they worked this out in the first place. So let's have a look at question 12. So methanol can be produced from the reaction of carbon monoxide and hydrogen according to the following reaction. So which set of these conditions will produce a maximum yield of methanol? So first thing we need to look at is that it's exothermic and that there are three moles of gas on the reactant side to one mole of gas on the products. Because we're being asked about how things react in an equilibrium, um, so which set of conditions produce the maximum yield of methanol, which is the only product, and that is going to be a high pressure because high pressure will favour the side with least moles of gas and, because it's exothermic, an end, a low temperature because we want to favor the side that has energy as a product. Um, and we see that here. All right, so here we have question 16. Um, an equilibrium of 1.0 liter vessel contains, and then we have question 16. A 1.00 liter vessel, um, so the reason they've told you it's a one liter vessel is so that we can convert these numbers here straight into calculations. Um, of 0 0.043 moles of hydrogen and 0 0.0620 moles of iodine and 0 0.0358 moles of hydrogen iodide. Um, system represents is represented by the following equation. This is actually a pretty common equation. Um, you'll have seen this a few times in the course of your studies. Which of the following is the closest value to the equilibrium constant for this reaction? Now remember, there's our expression. Um, and we do that by putting the numbers in and divide it just to so plug and play. And that will give us 48.1. All right. So a student uh, makes a solution with a final volume of 200 milliliters by mixing 100 milliliters of 0 0.0500 uh, moles per liter barium nitrate solution with a um, 100 milliliter of 0 0.100 moles per liter. All right, so it's going to give you a chance to have a think about this. All right, so what I want you to do here is pause the video, um, have a read of the question. It's a long one, and we'll come back to it in a sec. Okay, so which identifies if a precipitate will form under these conditions and the reason? And the answer is no, and that's because the reaction quotient is less than the KSP. So because the reaction quotient is less than the KSP, that means it's not achieved its solubility at this point, or its maximal um, solubility. We haven't reached that limit. All right, here we have another um, equilibrium question. This one could fall both into module five and module six. Um, the HSC identified this as a module five question, makes sense. Um, 
but I know that when a lot of us are studying, this would come into module six. So when we do the module six video, this will be there as well. Uh, so which of the following is identifies the strongest acid and the strongest base? Um, and this is a straight up one. Um, the answer there is question A. So now we move into the multiple mark questions here. Um, we're going to go through with each of these, both how the marks are awarded as well as give you a sample answer. So in the first part, we're being asked to sketch the concentrations after the time T. Something has happened in this situation here, and that is, this is the water gas shift equation. Uh, and one of the things we've done is we have removed um, some carbon monoxide. And we can tell that because the concentration has dropped rapidly, and then it started to change from there. So um, carbon monoxide and, sorry, yeah, carbon monoxide and water are both reactants, okay? So as one is removed, it then moves to increase their concentration. Brrr, that happens there. Um, and then the products will start to decrease along here. We'll go into why in a second. Um, the products start to decrease. Um, and we see that here. That should say reactants. Um, and that should say products, because obviously I've mix those around while writing them down, but you understand what we're saying. Um, so another thing you need to make sure you address is that all of these lines are straight. Use a ruler. I did this on the computer, so it's a bit trickier to do that, although I worked out how to do it for the next couple questions. Um, so use a ruler to show that equilibrium is achieved. So you got the marks if all are correct. Um, you got one if there was an error, a single error. Um, and that could have included, by the way, that these lines weren't straight. So they do need to make sure that they are straight. Uh, so now let's look at the second part of it. Using collision theory, explain the change in the concentration of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sorry, after time T. So <laughs> I, I've highlighted it because it's interesting, right? So if you fully explain the concentration ch changes of carbon monoxide, to do that, you're going to have to reference the other molecules, okay? So that's important. That's how you get three. If you describe the changes with some explanation, so in other words, if you're not referencing the other molecules properly, or if you're not describing uh, what mechanics are causing it to change, you'll get a two. If you've just written down something relevant, you're going to get a mark for this. So never leave blank questions. So at time, the concentration of carbon monoxide is reduced. Um, less carbon monoxide leads to a decrease in the forward rate of reaction um, because there's less collisions so then we the reverse rate of reaction the going backwards is now increasing so it's now greater than the forward so the carbon dioxide and the um, hydrogen concentrations decrease which increases the carbon monoxide and the water concentrations um, and as this increases the rate of reactions reach a new equilibrium um, so they become equal so yeah so that's how we get those three marks and you'll see that we again we talked about um, the mechanics behind it, we've talked about um, what it means to achieve an equilibrium, and we've talked about it in terms of collisions. Um, if you've not talked about this in terms of collisions and just talked about it in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, you're probably only going to get the one mark for it. That's where it would have been reasonably harsh. All right, so question 27. Um, give it a read, pause answer the question and let's continue. Okay, so um, this one here is uh, done by KW equals KB times KA. So we can switch that around. We know what KA is. Uh, we wanna see what the KB is. KW is one times, um, that should be a zero, one times 10 to the negative 14 uh, divided by 3.0 times 10 to the negative 8, and that gives us a 3.3 um, times 10 to the negative 7. Uh, so that's that's how we get to that one. Nice and straightforward. So that's our KB. And it's a one mark if you've got all of it there. So we're now going to have a look at question B. Um, so we've got the conjugate base dissociation constant, KB. Um, for the following equation, calculate the pH of a 20 mole per litre solution. Yay! 
All right. So when we're doing this, we know that KB is, it's from above. Um, so we know that the equation looks like this. Um, products over reactants equals this value. KB is very small. Therefore, the concentration which changes is not changed significantly. And to do this, we want to use an ice box. Um, set your ice box up neatly. Um, make sure it's in your working. Um, and it stands for initial change um, equilibrium. So what is an equilibrium? We have water here. That's an Na. I like to write the equation up above. Um, I find it makes my life a bit simpler. Uh, we know what the initial concentration of the um, uh, the hypochlorite hypochlorite sorry um, ion is it's zero point two zero. We also know that the concentrations for these ones are zero to start off with. So um, when this one changes, this is going to be used up, which means it's minus x, and these ones are going to be plus x. But as we said, Kb is very small, so that means this change is not changing in a way that is significant, and it won't appear up in our calculations. Um, so it will end up equaling about 0 0.20. Um, and so it'd be like 0 0.19999, something down here, um, seven decimal places down. And these ones are going to be whatever x is because they're starting at zero and they're adding x. So we then write this down as x squared equals, sorry, x squared divided by 0 0.20 equals 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative seven. Um, and then we square root that all, do it multiply it together, square root it, and we end up with our value here, but it's really, so that's what our x value is, but it's really important that we indicate that we understand that, that is our hydroxide concentration right there. Um, so another place that could happen, another place they could ask you to infer stuff, etc., would be to describe the impact or why we are able to treat this as a very small number um, and therefore still at 0 0.20. How does that affect our level of significance? So that's something else we'd get to get to. All right. Oh, sorry, we're after the pH, not the POH, not the concentration. So the POH equals minus log 10 um, to the uh, concentration of OH, which gives 3.59. So pH is 14 minus the POH, which gives us 10.41. So I just did something really simple, right? A really easy mistake to make. And that is where you get, you, you do a big chunk of working out and you get to a, a number that makes sense, right? Like this is a concentration, we're done. So often in chemistry, that's what we're looking for. And I'd started to move on. It is really important that you stay switched on when you're doing these. So well done me, I've taught you a lesson. Um, you have, you got four marks if you showed the correct calculations with all working. So if you didn't do this ice box, if you did this on your head or if you did it on a bit of scrap paper, um, or you just worked it because you don't need to do it. There's a chance that you won't get all the marks. Um, if you've got it mostly the correct working, but not necessarily the right answer. Um, if you have some relevant steps. So if you just did say this section here, you could still get two out of four. Um, some relevant info. If you've just written this line here, um, KB is very small. Uh, therefore that concentration won't change significantly. That's probably going to be a mark. If you did this, that's going to be a mark. If you did an ice box there and it was somewhat correct, that's going to be a mark. So make sure you, you write something down. Okay. Um, this is a, um, a question which is for module eight, I believe, with the exception of the part A. So we're only look at the part A here and the rest of it's going to be for later on because it's, I believe it's to do with off the top of my head, um, uh, some form of testing. Uh, okay, so read the question and then we'll come back to it and explain the treat the recommended treatment with reference to solubility. So we need to talk about solubility and we need to have a chemical equation. So calcium hydroxide um, is what they're talking about using uh, to remove the solid lead and copper ions. So we talk about how we use the calcium hydroxide because it's it's low solubility, but 
lead and copper hydroxides are even more insoluble, very low KSP. So now we've talked about solubility. So therefore, if we use, if we dissolve the calcium hydroxide in there, that will produce a precipitate of the lead and the copper ions, which we can then filter out. Um, and here's the equation I've chosen to include, which is the lead plus hydroxides gives us um, lead hydroxide. So that's an ionic equation. And there's, there'd be a mark there for each. There's like so many different equations you could use that. You could use um, calcium hydroxide. To be honest, you could probably use calcium hydroxide dissolving, like splitting, if you wanted to. Um, you could do calcium hydroxide. You could do this as a non-ionic equation. So calcium hydroxide um, plus lead ion gives you uh, lead hydroxide plus calcium ions, stuff like that. Now, if they ask you to justify it, you'd also talk about how um, calcium is still not great for the water, but it's less of a problem than lead, and, or significantly less of a problem than lead or copper. Okay, so this is a fun question. Um, again, pause, have a crack at it, and we'll continue on. So we're going to compare the effects of enthalpy and entropy on the solubility of these salts. Um, do you know what's fun? Is this is a Gibbs free energy question. This is essentially a year 11 question um, that's been, no, it's a year 12 question, but the year 11 stuff is the backup to it, is the, the background knowledge. So your marks come from comparing um, the enthalpy plus the entropy in relation to the solubility of both salts. Um, that's three marks. If you compare the values for both and identify the solubility, so which one's more soluble, which one will dissolve in water. Um, spoilers, it's magnesium chloride. Um, you get two marks, just some relevant information. If you were to say, this is Gibbs free energy and it's to do with whether this will happen spontaneously at this temperature here, that would get a mark. If you would say that these values here are all state dependent, possibly you would get a mark. Um, okay, so let's look at our marks, our sample answer. So delta G is energy to prevent change, okay? So Gibbs free energy is energy to prevent change. As magnesium chloride is negative, it will dissolve spontaneously. Delta G for magnesium chloride is positive and will not dissolve in water spontaneously because there's energy to prevent that change from happening. Um, both have a negative S and therefore contribute positively to delta G through this section of the equation. Remember, delta G is delta H minus temperature in Kelvin multiplied by entropy. And one of the things we notice about entropy is it tends to be fairly small values. Um, so we've talked about the entropy there. They've both got a negative entropy. Um, delta H of magnesium chloride is significantly negative. So it's negative, but it's a, a large value at negative 160. Um, which overcomes the positive contribution of the entropy to it, um, means that it's soluble. However, the delta H for magnesium fluoride is negative, but small in magnitude. So it will not overcome that value. Where this actually means that there's probably a there is a temperature where it will obviously dissolve. So the hotter it is, the more it will, um, the more it will work. Uh, okay, sorry. So focus on what we're doing but small in magnitude, so it will not overcome the positive contribution. Um, and delta G is positive, therefore not soluble at 298 Kelvin. All right, so that's a fun question. That's a hard question. That is a tricky question, and that's why it's the third last question in the paper. Uh, so this is the last one for us. And it's going to involve another ice equation, um, another ice box, sorry and we'll see how we go. Okay, so read this question, and then we'll get to it. Okay, so we know what our KEQ is up here, and we know that our, ex our expression for our KEQ is because products over reactants in concentrations. Um, so we can then put that in an ice box. See, we've set it up like that again. Um, minus X, minus X. We're assuming that X is significantly smaller or significantly less than 0 0.10. And the reason we can do that again is because um, that is a 10 to the negative 11 there. Now, the other thing we could do is we could not do that and we could solve it using the quadratic equation. I would rather not do that because 
I hate it. And this is an equally valid way to do it. So KEQ equals um, this value here, blah, blah. So then we end up with 0 0.100 squared on the bottom. Um, of, so as the denominator, um, x squared divided by that equals our value here. Um, and then we square root it off, so multiply and square root, and we end up with 6.75 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per litre. Um, all right, and that's the final module 5 question in the 2019 paper. Um, look for module 6, that'll be up next, and then module 7 and 8. And I hope that helped. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below. If you found any mistakes that I've made, by all means, put those in the comments below. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.